All right, guys, gals, and pals, we're off with another Shaman King spinoff, and this one takes place after the events of the Shaman fight, and where all the main characters now have kids. You're gonna be shocked who Ren had a baby with. Anna and Yo actually opened up a hot springs, Joko is in jail because he's still a gangster from New York, and How is still literally God. Let's jump into this. We follow a little boy named Hannah, the child of Yo and Anna. And he's already so freaking strong that entire gangs come over just to beat him up, but they never really get far. Specifically Ryu's number one fan, Ryuji. Because apparently no one is creative when naming their children. I mean, he's not his kid, he's just a fan, but still. But Hannah isn't the chill and laid back kind of bro that Yo was. He's more than okay with beating the ever living crap out of people. Hannah is honestly kind of angry that his dad is so cool and got to do all these cool things and become one of the most well-known shaman in history of forever. But Hannah doesn't have that. The next shaman fight isn't for another 500 years, so he's afraid he's just gonna live in his father's shadow his whole life. Lucky for him, there's these mysterious figures who are in town looking to cause trouble. And these guys don't like the Asakura main family line because they're actually descendants of Hao, and so they think that they're the rightful heirs to, you know, God himself and they waste no time getting down to business. And he isn't really any match for Hannah. It doesn't take him long to break that dude's weapon and beat him. Turns out that these guys are from a branch of the Asakura family that have been ready and waiting to enact Hao's original plan. You know, the one where Hao wanted to destroy all of humanity except for the strongest shamans. After Hannah defeated the one super weak dude, he sees a mysterious girl outside his house, hiding behind a street lamp. And because he's a young pubescent boy, the only rational reason why she, she would be there is because she totally wants to ask him out. And so yeah, you can guess how well that goes. And sure, they fight a little bit, but Hannah starts to really drill into her, saying that, what does it matter being the main Asakura line? Sounds to me like you're being manipulated. Sounds pretty suspicious to me. I kind of feel bad for you. And that kind of hits her hard. She'd never really thought about what she was doing for herself. She was just taking orders from her parents. They'd been isolated their whole lives, so they don't actually know much about the outside world. But since it's still all she knows, she does the only thing she knows to do, and push forward with trying to kill Hannah. But then, surprise bitch, here comes the little brother coming from behind for a surprise attack. Oh. Oh, they actually got him. Ah, but don't worry. Another mysterious figure comes to save Hannah. And she beats up those two weirdos, claiming that Hannah is her fiance. Okay, we get it. You're drawing parallels to the original manga, but adding a twist by switching character traits. It's not original. I mean, I am still having fun reading it, but I'm just saying a lot of people do that. I actually am really liking it, but for all the people who probably don't, I'm standing here pretending like I don't like it to echo their opinions. When honestly, I think that kind of trope is a very fun way to explore new characters. Oh crap, she's cute too. She says that she's the daughter of Silva from the Patch Tribe. Future me, throw up a picture of Silva for those who don't remember. There he is. And apparently she's also the first disciple of Anna, I guess. Turns out that she's actually the girl that Yo and Anna chose to marry Hannah. Her name is Alumi. And it may be obvious, but I'm pointing it out anyway, the line of Silva's family are all named after metal. Silva is silver, Goldva is gold, Alumi is aluminum, or aluminium for you tea drinking fancy folk. It's not creative, honestly. Not really any of their names are creative, but if you aren't creative, it's smart to just make a joke of it. So even though it's obvious, I still like it. Anyway, nobody really knows what she's going on about, but Alumi says that she's there to start the beginning of waging war against heaven. Ryu starts remembering the days of when they were in the shaman fight, when, you know, going against the members of the Patch Tribe, and he remembers something bizarre one of them said. Just before Hao awakened as God, one of the Patch members said, what if the shaman fight was started to investigate something? And that was never truly fleshed out. Now Ryu is wondering if Alumi has anything to do with what she was talking about. 
also, that's not really an alien. That's just the costume she dressed up as, but who knows, maybe they're investigating aliens. We'll find out eventually. So Tamao, who is now all grown up and is kind of awesome, not gonna lie, Future me, put up a picture of what Tamao used to look like. There you go. Now she runs the hot springs while Anna and Yo are away. And she decides to just cut to the chase. She finds the place where those two kids who are descendants of Hao live in order to confront them, and summons a great Tengu to just go ape shit on it. Because screw subtlety, we're here to get stuff done. And when the father fights Tamao, he loses super fast because their whole family is weak after being secluded for so long. And Tamao, who is slowly becoming the best character of this spinoff, tells him off, saying that he's being an abusive father and that his children need to be put in school and given a normal life. And so he does exactly that. Hannah finds out that the crappy kid who stabbed him through his stomach, Yohane, is now a transfer student at his school. Funny enough, turns out Yohane just flat out tells him that there's no way he can beat Hannah, regardless of the fact that he's been training his whole life to kill that branch of the Asakura family line. And they kind of form a truce. And the sweet part is that both of them realize neither of them have any friends. Hannah is a jerk who just kind of hates everyone, and Yohane has been isolated his whole life. So both of them are alone. And so a softly budding friendship begins blooming. The only problem is that Hannah doesn't really want any friends, which is kind of why he doesn't have any, so that'll be a problem. But then they go back to class, and of course, Alumi is transferring to their school as well. Little do they know, another strange and mysterious figure who just so happens to have a spirit ally that looks like Bill Cipher is watching them, scheming something. Who knows what? And because Hannah doesn't want to deal with Alumi embarrassing him, he convinces Yohane to skip school and go to the mall. But Alumi follows them anyway. And Luca, Yohane's sister, also got transferred to the bad school with all those thugs. And she's already got them all on her side. And they're there too to kill Hannah. And somehow she turned Amitamaru to stone. How an incorporeal being can be turned into stone is beyond me, but now Hannah won't be able to fight at full strength. And without Amitamaru, Hannah goes down fast. What he usually didn't hold back because Hannah always beats them, but he realizes he may have gone too far. And Yohane realizes his sister is acting way more sadistic than usual, and he suspects she's actually being controlled by another spirit. Hannah manages to wake up, and because his head was literally cracked open and bleeding out, he just had a near-death experience. And when shamans have a near-death experience, their mana increases, and Hannah's true power releases. Hannah conjures several demons to help him, and he doesn't look like he's really thinking rationally, as if he's operating on pure instinct rather than any form of rationale, and he goes so far as to summon a massive demon similar to the size of a high spirit. But unlike the high spirits we've seen, this one is dark like a shadow. And the massive demon takes hold of Luca's oversoul and crushes it within its grip. As it does, Luca seems to be released from her sadistic trance. And before the demon can go on a rampage, Alumi busts in from above to stop it. Now, when they have a moment to breathe and to talk, Alumi tells Yohane why Hannah is able to summon so many demons. When Hannah was a baby, Yo and Anna took him to the Middle East, where they were attempting to garner peace in a difficult land. And it was there where all three of them were being attacked. Hannah actually died once before. He met Howe in the spirit realm, and Howe's condition for bringing Hannah back was to fill him with demons. If he's ever on the brink of death, the demons will save him. And the creepy man stalking them was actually the person who was influencing Luca to become so sadistic. He has abilities to alter reality with his spirit ally, and was the one behind the attempted murder of Hannah. Using a series of reality warping cards, he's able to do just about anything. Reverse time a few seconds, influence people's minds, or in this case, turn spirits into stone so that they can't be used in battle. And now, he has Amitamaru held captive. Now, having his spirit ally stolen from him, and having been embarrassed in battle, as well as realizing he doesn't truly know who he is or why he has so many demons inside of him, Hannah wallows in self-pity as he tries to come to terms that, on his own, he's truly weak. As he's sitting alone, a boy comes to talk to him. 
and of course, picks a fight with Hannah because everyone kind of wants to kill him. But Hannah starts getting a bit too comfortable using the power of the demons, even going so far as to allow it to become an armored oversoul and starts becoming mindless and bloodthirsty again. But this strange boy has an armored oversoul of his own and decides to show Hannah just how strong he is by managing to cut his demon in half. Thankfully, the new guy isn't actually on the enemy team. Alumi shows up to settle everything and start explaining what's going on. So get ready for some exposition. She explains that the previous Shaman Kings aren't too happy with Hao being the new Shaman King. And when that happens, the previous Shaman Kings hold a council where they all decide the fate of the planet. But because if these gods actually duke it out, using their unlimited supreme power, they just kind of wipe out humanity by accident. So they elect representative shamans to fight in a proxy war. And so Hannah, Alumi, and the others are elected to represent Hao in the upcoming war. And Hannah seems a little stoked to finally have something to do that will carve his own name instead of living in the shadow of his father. And their biggest enemy is Yavis, the Bill Cipher looking twerp who's actually the god of modern capitalism, turns out. He despises Hao the most, and he's going to be a ridiculously tough opponent. And Kamogawa, the guy standing next to Yavis, wants Hannah to join him and whatever evil scheme he's planning. And he plans to break that demon curse he currently has on him. Anyway, here's the crazy thing. They all sit together and eat because all the bad guys eventually become friends, just like always. And they start to explain what's in it for them if they win the proxy war. Each shaman that fought for their respective god gets to ask for a miracle, something that only God himself can grant. And so Hannah goes on a little walk to really chew over everything. And on his walk, he finds this one kid with really, really bad hair. And this kid just so happens to be the son of Tao Ren and Jean the Iron Maiden. And what else would you expect someone born to a masochist and a near psychopath, but to immediately attack Hannah just to see how good of a fighter he is. And of course, Hannah just unleashed his, his demons so that he could actually stand a chance against him. And that kid reveals that he actually hoped Hannah was strong because he needs help saving his mother, Jean. And Hannah starts getting glimpses of memories that he's forgotten, or rather, memories that were stolen. And he just can't figure out why there are parts of his past that are simply gone. And so Howe appears as an apparition and explains to Hannah that his memories were erased. He tells him that the child of Anna, who's mastered Howe's techniques, and who is related to Howe himself, is an incredibly feared child. And he explains that Hannah actually just died a little bit ago, which is really why Hannah is actually able to see Howe. And in order to be resurrected once again, Hannah needs to go through a trial, defeating an echo of his father, Yo. And their fight serves two purposes. One, it allows Hannah to vent about how Yo is never around since he's always leaving on trips to try to make the world a better place, while also giving Yo the chance to properly teach Hannah how to fight. And Yo, obviously being the superior fighter, knocks out Hannah in next to no time. Yo tells him that he's missing something. Regardless of skill, wisdom, or technique, there's one thing he's missing that without, he'll never be able to defeat Yo. And so, unconscious within the Great Spirit, Hannah basically traverses his own mind as if he's physically there. And while he's traversing the Great Spirit, he meets a man named Second Lieutenant Sakurai, whose plane just got shot down during wartime. The problem is Hannah knows that they're still within the Great Spirit and both of them are dead. Sakurai just doesn't know it. And you know who is crazy enough to follow Hannah all the way to hell? Kamogawa, the dude working with Yavis. And so Kamogawa and Yavis show up all friendly-like, wanting to chat. But since Kamogawa says that he wants Hannah to join him to kill Hao, Hannah jumps straight into action. But Kamogawa can use Yavis to read people's minds and materializes Yo's white swan oversoul just to ensure that Hannah has no chance of beating him. And a flash of a forgotten memory strikes Hannah. Back who knows how many years, Hannah and Alumi knew each other one time, which is why Alumi is so familiar with Hannah. But he also remembers that all those years ago, there was a boy who attacked them, and he realizes that boy was Kamogawa. And while Kamogawa was distracted with Hannah, Sakurai 
That one dude that Hannah was talking to takes his opportunity to shoot Kamigawa. Remember, this is all inside the Great Spirit. Chances are Kamigawa isn't really dead. In fact, Hannah gets sent to another commune in the Great Spirit, where he meets Sakurai from the past, before he got washed up on that island. And when their base gets attacked, Hannah is forced to jump into a plane with Sakurai and really see how good he is at killing other people. And when it doesn't sit right with him and he just tries to stop him, Sakurai ends up shooting Hannah to make him quit. Back in the world of the living, Tao Men, the, you know, son of Ren and Jean, searches for clues to help his mother. Turns out Ryu has been holding on to Jean's Iron Maiden for years now. But Tao Men points out that it's actually a counterfeit. And that's when you find out that Lutsev and Salerm, the two children from the Shaman fight who inherited the Golem and originally killed Joko, are the ones who switched the Iron Maiden with a fake. And with them is this weird girl who goes by the name Black Maiden. Tao Men instantly recognizes her and goes in to attack, claiming that this girl is the one that he's been searching for. Turns out, this girl stole the mask of the real Iron Maiden, and Jean's spirit is trapped inside. And this girl murdered Jean, and is literally using his mother as her spirit ally to fight. And Tamao, being the badass that she is, basically just tells them to settle down so that they can discuss just what the heck is going on. Back to Hannah, having recently been shot through the head, he meets up with the other squad mates of Sakurai. And there they talk a little bit about what it's like for Sakurai during the war. To them, they think Sakurai is fighting because he hates the people who let themselves be carried along in the politics. They think he's fighting the people who abandoned their will to become tools for war. But Hannah knows the truth. When he talked to Sakurai, he told Hannah that the reason he's fighting is for someone he loves. And that's what motivates him to keep going. It's not because of some nebulous hatred or some vague concept, but rather for his love of another person. And Hannah has a revelation. That was what Yo meant when he said that Hannah was missing something. He realizes what he was missing was something to fight for. And that's what he needs in order to transcend hell and leave to return to his own body. Now, Shaman King Flowers ends there. The magazine that was publishing it discontinued it after volume six. Luckily, it does continue in Shaman King Superstar. However, because they are two separate titles, I do need to separate them into two separate videos. If you ask me, I like the sequel that Hiroyuki Take is developing, especially since he knows that, I get the feeling that he knows that there are certain aspects of his writing that he knows are weak points of his, and instead of just knuckling under and trying to power through it, he works with it by making it more of a joke. Kind of like lampshading it, but sort of not, really. And Hannah is becoming a really well-rounded character. It's obvious that he's developing what Yo and Anna have been doing this entire time, and I'm really excited to read it. However, because there isn't really a lot to go off of yet, that's really all of the personal input I can really put into this video. So it's less of a review and more of a, hey, it's not done. <laughs> I do plan to give a full in-depth discussion about what I think about it once I finish re reading and making a video on Shaman King Superstar. So look out for that video. I hope you enjoyed this video. Stay beautiful and keep playing.